We're going to talk about our hiring process, uh, all the steps we go through to get through and find the right person for the job, what we do when we onboard them, how we effectively train them so it doesn't eat up our whole life, and then how to retain the talent, right? You're going to put in so much time and effort into recruiting the right person for your team and your business. How do you retain that talent so you're not doing it again year after year after year? Okay, so are you ready? Why would you even hire an assistant? There's so many different types of leverage. Um, you know, one example is paying somebody to put the signs in the ground for you. Another example of personal leverage is having somebody mow your lawn or my favorite, Amazon Prime. I hate going to the store, but there's all these little types of leverage, but at some point you're really gonna need one-on-one -on -one, uh, leverage for your business. There's really two reasons that you're gonna hire somebody to work for you. You either wanna increase the amount of money you're gonna make, so increase your GCI, your gross commission income, or you want some luxury. You're going to buy back your time. The reason I am particularly passionate about this is when I got into real estate, I was recently divorced. My kids were two, four, and six years old. And I knew if I was going to be successful in this business, I could not run myself ragged and still be the mom I wanted to be for my little kids. So really from that point, I decided very quickly when I had proven to myself that this was going to be the career that I was staying in. I started my hunt and I didn't really know I was looking for Sarah, but Sarah is who I ultimately found. And so for me, when I first started, it wasn't about growing some team or growing some big business. It was just about having some extra time in my life. If, if it's not like a, a kid or a family balance, maybe you just want a hobby. Maybe you just don't want to work 80 hours a week, but you like real estate. So there's many, many reasons, but it falls into one of those two buckets. So again, when we're thinking about, are we ready? You have to think about the 80-20 principle. So 20%, excuse me, yeah, 20% of your activities are gonna lead to 80% of the production in your world. So if you don't have an assistant, then your top 20% is definitely going to be sacrificed. When you think about, um, if you don't have somebody helping you with the tasks, if you don't have an assistant already, then you are the assistant. And is that the best way for you to be spending your time? So these are questions to start asking yourself. And frankly, maybe you've already asked yourself these questions and here you are saying, okay, now what are the next steps? So the last couple things to qualify, whether you're ready, quote unquote, is are you doing about 30 units a year? Could be a little more, could be a little less, depending on your price point. But I follow the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book. This is not a pitch or, or a recruiting call to make you join Keller Williams. This is a non-agnostic book that has all the models in it. So I'm not creating these models. These are just the models that we live by. And so around 30 units, you're generating enough in GCI to afford an assistant. Now keep in mind that assistant should help you double your production. So you're not hoping to stay at 30, or maybe you are, maybe you're hoping to stay at 30 units and just offload some of the administrative work. And so you do have the opportunity though to grow doubling your production when you hire the right assistant. And I'm really going to kind of um, hone in on that right person, the right talented person that's going to help you grow your business. So let's just say, okay, you know what, Rachel, I did that already. I have a great assistant. Um, I want to grow even bigger. Well, at 60 units, right? Your assistant has helped you grow from 30 units to 60 units. At 60 units, it makes financial sense to have a second full-time administrative or operations staff working for you. Okay, moving on. What are the types of leverage you could consider? Because we're going to talk about budget and profit and loss to make sure that you're hiring the right type of candidate for what you're trying to accomplish. I would say, I would argue, anybody, any production level, getting into the habit of leverage is a pay-per-use transaction coordinator. And so what that is, is that eliminates overhead for you. That's not somebody who's on your salary. You're just paying them per transaction. And again, I know if you're on this call, you've already heard of this concept. But if you're not doing it, 
you're preventing yourself from growing, right? Because you're always going to get caught up in the fire. You're going to be caught up in the details. You're going to be, you're going to be in somebody else's to-do list for the day. You're going to be stuck in your email, chasing things down that really are not the best use of your time. So offloading that and allowing that little piece of control to leave your fingertips is a good jumping off point for growing into a bigger business. And that I will say is one of the biggest speed bumps that real estate agents come across is they go, I can't trust anybody to do it. I can do it better than anybody else. Well, I can assure you that Sarah, Sharice, and Shannon, who you can't see, can all do it better than I can. And they're providing such a high level customer experience that I'm not even going to interfere with what they got going on for me. So if you don't have a resource for a pay-per-use transaction coordinator, we will throw a resource in the chat. Maybe it's something you want to consider. Maybe you've looked around. Anyway, it's just an opportunity for you to consider that. The next is a virtual assistant. So there's a million companies. I really do like Cyberbacker, clearly. We have Sharice who's been on our team for over two years. Um, we'll put that link in the chat as well. And that is a great opportunity. They have part-time options and they have full-time options. And so depending on what your budget is, again, with the concept of I'm going to offload some of this for either growing my business or getting more time back into my world, then this can be a great opportunity um, that's more kind of budget friendly. And I'm going to tell you, it will shorten your timeline to lighten your load. Because as you're going to see when we're doing like the hunt for somebody who sits locally in today's job market, there's no guarantee of how fast you're going to find a really talented person. And then the last type, if you will, of leverage is having somebody in person with you. So somebody who like lives locally, they're going to report to the office every day. You guys are going to be working shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow. And this is somebody who's going to be working either part time or growing into full time or kind of whatever you need on the spectrum of where your business is. Okay. Okay. So the first thing you need to think about is a job description. So what do you want that person to do? Now, if you already have a paper use transaction coordinator, you don't need to think about the job description of a, of a transaction coordinator. Think more kind of globally, a, an executive assistant, somebody who's gonna help you run your business and start to learn all the little nuances, all the hats we wear as a real estate agent, and what do you want them to do? Maybe you don't want them to do every single thing. Maybe you're just like, hey, if they could handle this, that would allow me to focus on that. And so coming up with exactly what you need them to do in your world. The thing to think about, though, is how are you going to measure it? You know, how are you going to make sure that they are doing a good job and winning? So as you're creating the job description, also think about um how, how will you know that they're winning and how will they know that they're winning? So thinking about those details. Okay, moving along, where do you post it? If you have a company intranet, so we're at a, a big brokerage, so we have an intranet, um, you can post it there. If you're at a smaller brokerage, you might just send out a mass email to all the agents in your office. So why would you do that? This group of people might help you capture somebody who tried out the sales gig as a real estate agent and decided it's not for them because it's not for everybody. Some people love certain aspects of real estate, but the sales portion of it is too much to bear. And so it's helpful to grab somebody who already knows so many of the tools, um, but doesn't want to grow into sales any further. They've tried it and it's not for them. Potentially too, they might know somebody who is a good fit for you. The next place I would go is to my social media and my database. So both Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, wherever you're on for social media, blasting out that you need an executive admin and to your database. So all past clients, people you know, people you market to, let them all know that you're looking for an executive admin. What does that do for you? It lets them know that you are a rock star. You want them to know you're a rock star. Will they have the person you're looking for? Maybe, maybe not. But now they go, wow, 
Bob's really doing good out there. Like he is rocking and rolling. He needs a staff. Like this is a rock star real estate agent. I'm going to remember that Bob is doing so good that he needed to hire somebody. And a lot of time we get pushback on this idea of I'm going to send it out to everybody I know. What if Joe comes walking in and says, I'm ready to work with you. And you think to yourself, there is no way I'm going to hire Joe. Well, at that point, there's a very easy script that you can go to and say, oh my gosh, Joe, thank you so much. The reason I posted it out there is because I'm hoping my friends of friends might fit well in this position. I would never want to jeopardize our friendship if this didn't work out for either one of us. So thank you so much. It means so much to me, but I, your friendship is worth too much to me. I couldn't take that risk. So then you've t alleviated the idea of somebody you know raises their hand and you are already thinking, no, thank you. Okay, then we can go the traditional route, places like Indeed, Google Jobs, ZipRecruiter. But what we recommend is wise hire. So I'm going to take a two second break and let Sarah do some talking on this. And Sarah, how and why did we end up going to Wise Hire? So Wise Hire is my absolute favorite platform now going forward. It is a little bit of an investment, but it does help you find the right person. So it's $200 monthly. And what's great about it is it is like our MLS syndicating out to 100 plus other job boards and niche markets throughout the internet. So you don't have to go on to each individual platform, subscribe, manage your job posting, collect the ads and applications from one, bring it all together. It's all in one place. They even have dedicated coaches to help that will review your job posting and say, hey, did you think about making this edit? This catches more people's attention and things like that. And then there's also a platform within the system to manage all of your applicants. Are Is this person in phase one or are you about to give them an offer and everything in between that they will help set up, but you customize entirely to how you want to structure your process. So it's a fabulous resource. And Sharice will drop that link in the chat as well, and it'll go out after. Yeah. And so that is critically important. And we'll talk more about what today's job market is like, but having a really great resource like that, Wise Hire in particular, and again, like we're not getting a kickback. We're like literally telling you the hacks that we have learned after doing this time and time and time and time and time again. Um and I say that because it's not it's not easy. It's going to be a multi-step process and sometimes there's trial and error and sometimes you have to try again before you get the right candidate. Let's go. All right, so we're gonna spend a good amount of time right here. And I believe Sarah and I would both argue that this is the most important step of the whole process. So what you're looking for is a rock star. If you're a rock star and you want a certain caliber of person to work with, then you're going to have to spend some time weeding out the cul-de-sac talent. So we're all real estate agents. We know what cul-de-sac talent is. That's somebody who's going to get to the end. They're going to keep spinning around. They're never going to be looking for solutions. They're never going to be looking for growth. And that person is going to create a lot of friction in your world and you're gonna outgrow them. And instead, you want somebody who's going to own the role and help you grow the business. And even if, again, your goal is not to grow a humongous business, you just wanna be like an elite, um, high caliber real estate agent, then that is exactly what you need to hire too. So keep that in mind. I really can't stress enough that going through these steps really diligently is gonna be the key to making sure you're not pulling your hair out and that you're not wasting time and money. So let's kind of dig into these steps. So the first thing we have the candidates do, again, we're using Wise Hire, but whether they email you your their resume or whether you know your friend sends you their resume, whatever, you're gonna review the resume. Um, at that point, you're going to select your interesting candidates. So Sarah, why don't you add in what are the key things that you might be looking for when you're reviewing the resumes as they hit the Wise Hire platform? Yeah. So again, keeping in the mindset of you're looking for somebody in your operations world, um, I'm looking for things like, is it super messy or is it nice and organized? 
Um, are their jobs and the resume as a whole outdated or up to date, as well as any major gaps between work history and anything that catches my attention of like, hey, that will translate really well and shows high attention to detail. So little things like that to say, okay, this person has just graduated high school and it was scooping ice cream for three summers long versus maybe they come from the restaurant industry and things like that. Yeah, and what Sarah was really indicating there is you are hiring somebody for a highly detailed job. And so if they're not highly detailed on their resume, then that should that's reason enough to, to give you some pause. So those are things that we've noticed over the years. So after that, after Sarah's selecting her most interesting applicants, and you know, when you first post, it's gonna be hot and heavy. And then the longer your job description up there, it's gonna be a little bit slower. So as the applicants come in, she's going to review and select who's interesting. If she's interested in them, she then sends them an email. Now, yes, I have a Sarah, but you can still do these things, right? So we're at least creating a cheat sheet for you of how to, how to be the Sarah right now or how to find your Sarah. <laughs> I'm sorry to talk about you in the third person, but like just so you guys are getting a sense of how, how it works and how it can work for you if you do it right. So Sarah will send them an email that has several steps in it. And we're trying to get them to do a few different things. We want them to fill out a disk analysis. We want them to fill out a four tendencies quiz. And we also send them a values worksheet where they're gonna pick out their top 10 values off of a sheet and see if we think that they align to our values as our cultural like values as a team. Sarah, why do we do it this way? Why are we giving them so much information and so many things? I want to start to engage with this applicant and really at this point, see what their response time is like. And again, looking for that detail-oriented operations member, um, all of these things that we're asking them to do shouldn't take more than 20 to 30 minutes. So can they follow the step-by-step -step instructions and not miss a step? Um, and then two, we, we didn't pick three random things. There's meaning behind these different um, assessments we're choosing. So for the disc, there's lots of different ones out there. I just use the free version, Tony Robbins. Um, and when I get the results back, I'm really looking for somebody who either is an S or a C or some combination of that because they are highly detail oriented, super stable. Um, and you want somebody who's different from you because you're, you want their strengths to be different from yours. You want two separate sets of strengths and most agents are high D's. <laughs> so we are looking for somebody um, that is on the higher S and C spectrum for the disc. For the four tendencies, if you're not familiar with that, the four outcomes is an upholder, a questioner, an obliger, and a rebel. The two that I'm not looking for for an operations role is a questioner and a rebel because it's all about systems and they need to be able to follow them. So what I want is an obliger um, or a upholder because again, they're much more in line with operations, high detail oriented um, systems and things like that. And then for the values, this is kind of fun and quick, but we're just making sure that their values are aligning with us because it needs to be a cultural fit as well. So hopefully once they send that back, um, again, I'm looking for, do they respond in a day or do they respond in a week? Because again, we're dealing with contracts. So when there's deadlines, we don't want deadlines to be missed. And this is starts the self-selection out process. If somebody doesn't want to go through these steps, then we also know that they're probably not that interested in the role. So why are we going to keep moving them forward if they're not really all that engaged in the in the job posting so far? Um, so I think Sharice, if she hasn't already, will throw the disk analysis and the four tendencies quiz in the chat. Um, great tools, free tools. Um, again, we'll send out the worksheet on the values. Uh, and, and again, this is us starting to see who this person is and who they're going to show up as working with us as a group. Um, so it's part of, it's part of the interview process already, frankly. At that point, if things go well, they return everything, they follow all the instructions, we like the components of how they're showing up on these assessments, then at that point, 
we're going to do a phone screen. So Sarah, what are you trying to accomplish on that phone screen? I'm starting to get to know this applicant off of paper. Like, why are they even searching for a new job? Are they making a huge career change? Do they have any experience in real estate? Um, as well as allowing them to make sure it's a win-win for both sides and ask their questions. Because if they're coming with really great questions about us and the organization and things like that, that's a great sign to me. Um, I'm also going to take the time there to at a high, high level, go over the job description again and set some of the expectations and get clarity on the salary and benefits piece. Because quite frankly, like we've got a lot more steps to cover. And if we can't get on the same page for the salary, it's not going to be a fit for us. And we've Gonna, we're going to waste a lot of time and be a little bit disappointed when we're like, they're amazing, but they're like, I can't accept this salary at the end of it. Um, so that is the goal of the phone screening. And I usually tell them it's about 20 minutes long. Some people are chatting, other people aren't. So that's the average usually. Perfect. Great. And so at the end of the phone screen is the beginning of the double check-in. So if Sarah is interested or if I'm interested, we say, hey, listen, we think this is a good fit so far. Would you be interested in moving forward to the next step? And then that gives them the opportunity to decide if they would like to move forward. If both groups are moving forward, then we would move on to the personality assessment. And that like double check-in is going to happen at every other place along the way too. And that gives you kind of a rip cord if at some point they show too many red flags or if you've said something that they no longer want the job, then let them pull the ripcord so you're not continuing to go down this road with them when they're not interested. So the next six steps that we're going to talk about, they are somewhat um, geared toward tools we have at Keller Williams, but I'm willing to bet two things. Number one, these are available to in other forms, you know, out there on the internet or within your brokerage. If you are a KW, what I can tell you is this is the career visioning process. And so these six steps that we're going to go over is it in a nutshell, a very small nutshell. This class, this career visioning class could be an eight hour class. In fact, it is. And they teach it all over the country. But we are going to super boil it down because there's so many other good tidbits we're going to focus on. So please don't feel like this is just a Keller Williams, you know, tool here. So. The first thing is a personality assessment. Uh, here it's known as the KPA. It's gonna tell us what their personality strengths and weaknesses are, and really just where they are in certain spectrums to see if like their personality is gonna jive with your personality and if, there's, if their kind of personality and how they're hardwired is gonna be good for that type of administrative operations role. We ask them to a lot 45, to 60 minutes, you know, we actually tell them a little bit more to make sure they've given themselves enough time. And we say, hey, listen, make sure you're kind of in a quiet place and, you know, you can concentrate on the questions. And so again, this is another step in the process. How quickly do they do it? How quickly do they get it back to us? Um, do they just ghost us? You know, what what's going to happen at this point? And if somebody has taken the time to do that personality assessment, it's really in bad form if you ghost them at that point. They should at least be given the opportunity to hear what the results are, even if you don't think it's a match. The reason being is sometimes, even though you said give yourself 45 to 60 minutes, they didn't. And then at the end, they were running out of time. So they were click, 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 clicking. And it's not really a good representation of who they are. So allowing them, allowing you to say, hey, your answer was this. Is this a good representation of who you are? And they go, oh, no, no, that's actually, mm -mm, that's, that's no, I'm more like over here. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, that's what I wanted to hear. But also like if somebody took an hour to do something and then you never call them back, they're going to be thinking, well, what's so bad about my personality? So really think about whether you want to move this person to the next step or not, because you will have an obligation to go through whatever the results are, just in fairness to that applicant. If, if and when this is a good match for you, you're going to finally move them to an in-person interview. That's when you're going to validate or go over the results of the personality assessment, and you're going to do something called a thought process interview. Both of those things are in the same in-person interview, and at that point, you're really getting to know them. So Sarah, if you decide you're going to move forward with them, 
what do you what do you do for the next round of interviews? So the next section of validating the entire assessment is the life story and the motivational interview. And these are much more conversational and engaging. So I do like to do it on Zoom because I can push that record button and see if they're good with technology and be present for the conversations we're about to have and not worry about, oh, did I did I jot that down? Um, what did you say? Because I'm still writing the last note. Um, and so it's much more engaging for both sides so that they don't think I'm not listening to them either when in fact I am but I'm also trying to write everything down that they're saying and then the recording is great to have for future reference and share with other people that might need to see it for later on in the process yeah yeah and the zoom interview allows them to be a little bit more flexible right if they're going to take um if they're going to take this next interview like on their lunch break or something like that it allows them to not have to book another appointment out of out of their office or something like that so it allows us to keep the process moving without waiting long periods of time same thing at both of those in person and zoom hey this is looking good for us how do you feel it's looking for you would you like to move forward okay we do too here's what's going to happen next and we talk about the next phase so at this point if everything's looking good after the two uh, interviews, then we're going to ask them for references and, of course, call the references and hear what they have to say about the candidate. If that looks good, then we're going to schedule a group interview. And you're like, well, I'm an individual agent. How am I going to group interview? Okay. You would definitely have some trusted individuals in your life. It could be your managing broker. It could be a team leader. It could be that agent that you always ask to do showings if you're out of town or on vacation. It could be your trusted lender partner. It could just be a trusted associate. And who do you who do you really value their business opinion? And so you create this little group interview of three to five people who are going to come together and do an interview. Now, this is not you know, a firing squad for your applicant. It can certainly be casual. It can be at a coffee shop. It can be, you know, at a conference room in your brokerage, whatever is appropriate for kind of the way you do business. But you really want to be clear with the with the group that you're bringing together what you want them to accomplish. You want to be clear in two ways. What questions do you want them to go over or what do you want them to dig a little deeper on? You know, what were your red flags, if any, that you would like their opinion on? Don't send them in blind and just be like, hey, do you like them? Well, we're, we're all likable people and we tend to like people. So we're going to just say, yes, we like them. Go for it. But give your group, your panel, some really uh, detailed direction on where you'd like the conversation to go. The other thing you need to be clear on is when is that panel coming back to talk to you, the hiring agent, to go through those things? So don't just send them into a coffee shop with no plan on how to reconvene after, and then they all send you a text message with a thumbs up. You know, you want to tell them, okay, you're going to meet with the candidate for one hour at the Starbucks, and then the next day we're all going to get together on Zoom for 30 minutes, and we're going to debrief what you came up with. And this is a really important part of the process. So Sarah, I know you have some color and context to add to this. Um, you covered quite a bit of it. The only thing is if it wasn't clear for the group interview, you are not part of it or whoever is doing your hiring. So in our case, I usually am taking everybody through this process, so I would not be a part of it. Um, and perspe different perspective is absolutely encouraged, again, because this is the accountability piece that we're moving into. So at that point, you probably are jumping up and down or like, I'm ready to give this person an offer, or maybe you're not, but most times you are. And this is the part where like, what about that little red flag that you're like, eh, it's fine. They were just nervous or whatever it might be. This is the time that we're going to start diving deeper into the red flags, if you will. Yeah. And this is, the, I would definitely also say that this is the point where agents want to cut the corner and just be like, okay, can you start on Monday? Yeah. But you really, really need to, again, slow down. You're proving to this applicant that you're this invested in them. And that message should be felt loud and clear because they need to know that you want them to invest back into the team or the group or the, the duo that you're creating. So do not skip this step. Again, with every step along the way, you're also building the relationships of those around you. You're building the relationship with your future employee. And then, you know, in this particular case, you're building the relationships you have with either trusted other agents or your vendor partners. 
at the next step, if everything is looking good, nobody had such a red flag that made you pause and rethink your decision, you would move forward with an offer letter. And so what does that offer lever letter want to include? Their salary, their pay frequency, their start date, where they're reporting to, who their supervisor is, um, if you're offering any benefits, and then what forms of identification to bring to the first day of work. And we'll give you an example of an offer letter that we use. So you have a jumping off point. You got at least a template to start with. So what's the timeline on this? If you're doing this traditional in-person hiring, this is an unknown timeline, okay? So it could take one month. It could take a year to find the right person. It depends on the intensity in which you're going to follow through with this. So keep in mind that this is a job seekers market. So that means that there is virtually no unemployment. So it's at the lowest historical rates and there's still 10 million job postings in the US. So people have the pick of the letter and pretty high salaries than what they've been used to in the past. So you're really gonna need to create a compelling story of why they should come work for you. And if it hasn't kind of been imparted on you so far, this is not a, let's go meet for coffee and see if this is gonna work out between us. Like if you're really looking for a rock star, to be honest, it's not gonna show up in the first 30 minutes. They could present themselves as a, as a rock star in 30 minutes over coffee, but what if you're getting to know them on a deeper level? And what if you're starting to see some certain patterns in how they might operate on your team? The reason that it's a long process is to protect you and your investment as an agent in the long run. So keep this in mind. Yes, it hurts, but actually this is a great time to be taking this class as we're moving into the quieter months in real estate is take your time, hire slow, and keep in mind you should fire fast. And so their first 90 days on the team is a trial run. So at any point in those first 90 days, if you know it's just not working out, like things aren't clicking, they're not picking it up, you're feeling frustrated, at that point you part ways. And you part ways for two reasons. You part ways for yourself and your PL, but you also part ways for that candidate because it's really not fair to that candidate to string them along and prevent them from finding a position that would be a better fit for them in the long run. So just a data point, salary.com says a real estate administrator in the Bedford, New Hampshire market is being paid $33,000 a year, and that's a full-time position. I would beg to differ. I think that's a little low. I think the jumping off point is $40,000 a year. So that's my two cents, but there's some data for you. Um, we want to give you some pro tips, things we've heard and pitfalls to avoid. I suggested hiring somebody who's transitioning out of sales. They know some stuff. They didn't like sales. Avoid the folks who are transitioning into sales. This Band-Aid approach is, I think, the number one Achilles heel for all real estate agents. Is they're just getting started. They're so smart. They're already learning the tools anyway. Yep. And then they're going to learn on your dollar, your time, and then they're going to leave. This is not the type of person you want to invest your time in. So Sarah, what else could you add about that? The other thing I hear a lot is I can do both. I'm like, that's great for you, but it's not great for us and who we're looking for because we're looking for somebody to grow in this role, build new systems, upgrade the ones that we have, create an even better client experience and team experience. Um, and so if they're focused on themselves and not our business, it's not the right fit for us. It's also for operations, when things slow down, operations speeds up. There's no slow periods in operations. And if there is, you might have another question to ask yourself. Yeah. Um, so just trying to avoid that concept. I mean, the thing is, is like, how do you really want that person to be working for you 40 hours a week and then also working nights and weekends to grow their sales business? And so what, they're just going to be working 80 hours a week? Like what's the, what's the, the value that they're going to be bringing to your organization if they're strung out and exhausted all the time? So the other pro tip is don't just hire your nephew, your cousin, your neighbor who just got unemployed. You can consider them, but just because they fall in your lap doesn't mean it was meant to be. So Sarah, I know we've run into some of this before. 
So if you do have that person that's coming to your world and you're like, okay, maybe they are a rock star because it does happen. It's not the end all be all, but you're going to take them through all of these steps and you're not going to skip one, including the defense panel, because they need to check out and make sure that they are the right fit for your role and not your personal relationship because you're hiring. Um, and if they check out, then cool, they might be the rock star you're looking for. But if they don't, then it's not going to be it's not going to be the right fit for the role and you could harm your relationship with them. Yeah, yeah. And then where, you know, then you have to consider, okay, am I going the virtual route or am I going the in-person route? And there are uh, pros and cons to both, right? So the virtual route, you could find somebody very fast. Um, you can go part-time, you can go full-time. You can usually have some, some latitude on how you're going to hire. Are you going to go in person? Do you want that person to be customer facing? Do you want them to have a really good working knowledge of the region? So there's, there's pros and cons to going virtual and in person. And I would say budget tends to be the number one thing. You know, if you're just getting going and you want to get in the habit of having this person working for you, your budget might require you to go the virtual route versus is full-time sitting next to you side by side. Sarah, any other thoughts on virtual versus in-person? We could talk about this topic at length, but to keep it short and sweet, just know your role, the role you're hiring for, because there are, like we've been saying, pros and cons to both, um, but your role is going to dictate if it makes more sense to be in person versus virtual. Quick example, social media manager expert, absolutely great role to be entirely virtual. Transaction coordinator, where they might be putting out random fires in person is probably best for that. Um, so that's just two quick examples. Like I said, we could go in depth about that. Yeah. Well, and yeah, and a lot of this we could certainly spend hours discussing, but this is our crash course in helping you get off the ground. Okay, so things you need to think about behind the scenes. Okay, so first thing you need to decide is what is the salary you can afford and how often will they be paid? So are you going to pay them weekly, bi-weekly, so on and so forth? Um, salaries should equal about 20% of your GCI. So again, just reminder, GCI is your gross commission income. So how much money and commissions you're making. So we'll give some examples, but let's just say you're consistently making $100,000 a year, then 20% of that is $20,000 you're probably not going to get a quality candidate at 20,000 in New Hampshire or in New England 40 hours a week, but you could find a really great person who's a virtual assistant and work full time at that type of budget. So keep starting to decide what the what the details are going to be. Are you going to offer medical benefits? Well, most of us are don't even have medical benefits as an individual agent. So if you're not going to offer them, okay, that's acceptable, but at least be a conduit for giving them some ways to satisfy that requirement in their life. So start with your insurance broker. Like who's your trusted insurance broker? Ask them if they have any, um, like a medical insurance person on their team that you could refer your candidate to so they could be shopping to figure out, okay, well, what would this cost me if I had to get my medical benefits on the open market? And because again, they're an insurance broker, they probably have several options for your candidate. So just be the helper for them. Don't just leave them to figure it out on their own. Think about these things in advance. Think about what schedule you want them to keep. Are you an early bird? Are you a night owl? Do you expect them to work in the office? Do you expect them to work at home? Do you expect them to work in your home office? Like, where are they going to work and what hours are they going to work? So that's very clear to your candidate of what your expectations are. Um, do you want to offer a simple 401k? So if you as an agent want to start creating a 401k for yourself, work with your financial planner because that could be something that you're offering at a very low cost to yourself, to your candidate. That's a win for you as an agent and it's a win for them. And it could be even something that plays into uh, retention in the long run. Things you need to set up in advance is workers' compensation. So again, I'm going to go into my um, sphere of influence. And I'm going to say, who's my insurance broker? And let me ask them to shop their resources and find me a worker's comp policy. So mine, particularly my insurance agent put me with the Hartford and it cost me about $500 a year to have worker's comp insurance for my employee. And that is a W-2 salaried employee. 
Um, the next thing you need to set up in advance is payroll. Again, go back into your database, figure out who works at a local bank. Local banks end up being a great resource. A lot of them have payroll systems. And then you're helping somebody in your sphere. You're broadening your business to business relationships. And again, you're building up that, hey, now this person knows I have a staff member. You're going to be increasing kind of your reputation with that person and adding a benefit into their world. So we have we've done that. We've bounced around to several people. Ultimately, we've found our way to ADP as our payroll supplier. It's an online portal. It's very easy to use. Something for you to keep in mind is payroll tax and um, payroll fees. So obviously when that, that company is providing a service to you, they're gonna have their fees for running your checks and your end of year statements and W-2s for your employees to file their taxes. So there are fees associated with that. There's also payroll taxes to the government. And so the, those fees and taxes end up being an additional 10% on top of whatever your person's salary is. So that's kind of like if you end up with a $40,000 a year salary, keep in mind that's actually about $44,000 because you're going to have payroll taxes and payroll fees that need to be accounted for. So these are some pro tips. So let's just get into kind of the budget of everything and how this could, you know, fit into your world. So right now, solo agent, you're doing it yourself, your expenses are probably about 20%, maybe a little less, maybe a little bit more, depending on what you're investing your money in. You're like, I don't know, Rachel, that seems like a lot. Well, it's your license. It's your board fees. It's your MLS fees. It's signs. It's business cards. It's marketing. It's printing. It's your office fee. Um, maybe you invest in a coach. So all those things are about 20% of how much money you make, how much of your income or your, your commission you're making throughout the year. If you're adding a person, that's going to go from 20% to 40% expenses. So what does that really mean in the dollars and cents? So consistently year after year, you're making about 100000 in GCI. You are able to deduct about $20,000 in expenses. So that means you're keeping 80% keeping 80% of that money in your pocket. If you're going to hire somebody, you're now going to invest another 20% of your, your commissions into a salary. So now it's going to $40,000, but you're still getting to keep 60% for yourself. The goal potentially is to grow, right? You're, you're hoping this assistant is going to help you get more business, maybe. The other example is if you're making kind of on average $200,000 a year in gross commission income. So your expenses were probably around 40%. You were again, keeping 80% of all the money you made, all your fees after all the fees and tax deductible things, you were keeping about 80% of that. And again, now maybe you're gonna be hiring an in-person for $40,000 a year. And you're going to, your expenses are now going to $80,000, but again, you're keeping 60% for yourself. Again, maybe the, the intention is growth of your business. And one thing I, I think I might've skipped over is you could be thinking, oh my gosh, I don't have $40,000 sitting in my bank account to like give to this employee. Well, that's really, you're, you don't need to, right? This is not a $40,000 risk. This is a $10,000 risk. And the reason being is it's going to be a 90-day trial. And if it doesn't work out in 90 days, you really only invested $10,000 into this process. And so keeping that in mind, um, you know, that might make a difference in you deciding if you are ready to move forward. But that's like, that's the key point at this, at this stage of the game of this behind the scenes and getting prepared and deciding which way to go is you have to come to a decision. You have to have a gut check and you need to ask yourself, am I going to be a hiring expert? Am I going to be an expert trainer? Do I have any systems documented? Do I like extreme levels of accountability? Like if you're not showing up and you're not doing the work, well, not only are you not going to get paid, but your employee's not going to get paid. So there is going to be a new pressure of, I'm going to have to work very diligently and effectively to make sure that I'm winning the most amount of business that I, that I have in the past. And actually now that I think about it, it's like, 
this is where I hear from agents who are like, uh, maybe I should partner with the team because I could be having all of those benefits because I'm already going to be giving away 60 or 40% of my income. So a 50, 50 split with no risk is a benefit to me, but all right. Anyway, I digress. Let's um, move on to onboarding because we're, and we're doing great on time. So we're going to make this pretty short and sweet. I'm going to try to, there's just so many good things to cover. Okay. So the first thing that we do to make this like special is bef we they accept our offer. Yay. We're so happy. We made it through. They're starting. So we send them a Google form and we ask them for what are their favorite things. So some things we might ask them, what's their favorite food? What's their favorite candy? What's their folk? favorite local restaurant? How do they take their coffee, right? So we want to kind of know some like little personal things. So it helps on the first day, but then it helps on work anniversaries and birthdays and that kind of thing. So we can continue to make their experience with us feel special. And so their first day on the job, we're going to give them something off of their favorite things list. So whether it's um, their favorite candy or something with your team logo on it or something like that. And we're going to give them an onboarding binder. In the binder, it's going to have our mission. This is our team's mission, our mission, our vision, and our values. It's going to have a W-4 for them to fill out. It's going to have an I-9, so you're compliant. We'll send you copies of those so you don't have to search for them. But the important thing is it's going to have something called a 30, 60, 90. And you're like, okay, what is that? More acronyms. So what do you want them to accomplish in the first 30 days? What do you want them to accomplish in the next 30 days? And what do you want them to accomplish by the, the final 30 days? And that's the end of the trial phase where you're going to know if this person is, is an asset to your business or they're detracting from your business. Um, Sarah, anything that you wanted to add about the 30, 60, 90 on this section of onboarding? For onboarding and training, this is the most important piece and where that super high level of accountability comes in. Because yes, you are holding them accountable and signing off on it at your 30, 60, and 90 day check-ins to say, yes, I agree, you've mastered X, Y, and Z skill. Um, but then if things start going sideways a year, two years from now, and they pull this out and they're like, oh, you said I mastered these skills. And now you say, I've not been doing it right all along. Well, that's on you because you signed off and said, yeah, it, it's, it's good enough, but is good enough right for the role and what you're looking to achieve long term. Okay. And keeping an eye on our time, I do want to get through like some of the key bullet points in training. So for each of the 30, the 60, and the 90, pick only five tools or goals for each of those months. And you're like, well, that doesn't sound like a lot. Well, if you want them to master DocuSign or Dot Loop or MLS, like those are vast tools. And so if that there's five of those vast tools, then that probably is enough for the month. And then you want them to be an expert. And if they're a rock star, maybe you pull in something from the 60 and then you replace it. And so just keep in mind, five tools or goals in a month is really what the expectation is. Um, and only train on each of the 30-day increments. Now, I, I have these in, in bold, or excuse me, in red, because these are the big takeaways on training. Every single time you train on anything, do it on Zoom. It doesn't have to be scripted. It doesn't have to be nice. It doesn't have to have captions. You don't have to shower. You can show up in your pajamas. Like none of it matters. You just want to capture the training. And if the phone rings, you pause the recording, you answer the phone, you re reconvene on the training. Then you label it. Maybe it's MLS input. And then you put it into a, a training library. We use just Google Drive. So next time it comes to that person needing to do an MLS input, you say, okay, great. We got a new listing go watch the training video and only come back to me with questions. So the beauty of that is they come back with questions and you record the questions and then that's MLS input training two. And then the third listing that comes along, you say, go watch the first two videos and only come back to me with questions until you've exhausted all the questions and they're doing a proficient job. Why is that important? Number one, you've immediately leveraged your time. You do not have to keep training on MLS input. Number two, if that candidate grows into another role on your team, 
they now have a training library for their replacement. Or the, the other end of the spectrum is they were terrible. At least you have some training tools that you've now created for the person that you're going to go through the whole process with and hire that rock star. Couple things again on tight on time. So I'm gonna kind of zip over a couple things. You're going to have to slow down in order to speed up. Um, it's gonna be painful. We're all high moving, you know, fast moving people. We wanna get all the deals. We wanna win the deals, but you're gonna have to slow down. Leverage your broker's training. Send your assistant. Now, great, you're like, they're not gonna be a real estate agent. They need to learn the lingo. They need to learn the tools. Send them to the office and let them learn. Same thing goes for if you have a virtual assistant. They can get on Zoom. They can do the same trainings on Zoom. Leverage what's already existing for you. When you learned how to do MLS, what did? how did you learn? You probably went into the MLS resources and watched the videos. Have your assistant do that. Like, There's no reason that you have to do all the heavy lifting. Use the, sort, the resources that are already available to you. They're not going to be 100% efficient on day one. So reset your expectations there. Be with your assistant as much as possible. Um, I wish I highlighted this one in red. If you want your person to be a rock star, if you want them to show up the same way you show up, let them listen to you. Let them come on appointments. Listen to Let them listen to you take phone calls. Um, they're going to learn the vocabulary. They're going to learn how you handle things, the tone in which you're interacting with people just the more time you can spend with them, that is on the job training. Okay, this we're almost to the end. So thanks for hanging in there, everybody. All right, so things that you can do for retaining your talent. So you've recruited a rock star, they've taken the position, you've onboarded them, they're training great and you're like, oh my God, I hope they never leave. Great, so things you need to think about, giving them paid time off, holidays, actual paid vacation, um, sponsoring team lunches or just check-ins that are lunches. Do you get team swag? Do you work with your financial planner and offer a 401k that benefits you and them? Maybe after 90 days, you you get them licensed. You pay and on your time and on your dollar, you pay for your system be to be licensed. Not to get into sales, but to be a backup in case of emergency to open a door, to be able to legally answer all the questions that somebody might have when they call in on your listings. And potentially you're giving them the opportunity to make more money working with you that doesn't come directly out of your pocket. So when they refer their best friend, their mom, their cousin to your team, they're getting referral income and you your, yourself as the, as the primary agent is winning because now they can you can take their referrals and they get a cut of it. Um, giving them growth opportunities, grow your world big enough that they want to stay with you. A rock star is going to want to keep growing, keep learning and keep moving. So making sure you're creating some growth opportunities for them and then not crossing work hour boundaries. Do not text your person at 10 PM. Do not text your, text your person at five in the morning. Be professional. If you need them to do something, put it on their calendar. If you need them just to get something done at some point the next day, send them an email. Don't be blowing them up, calling and asking for favors all the time. You want them to be a hundred percent ready to rock for you during business hours. And if you're dragging them into the sales world, they're not going to be you know, fully ready to go when you want them to during the business day. And I'll just put Sarah on the spot for one second. Is there anything that, you know, has worked over the years? You've been with the team for more than five years now. Like, what are the things that speak to you on this list? Yeah, I think it is the same from day one to now. Um, it's the growth opportunities around with where we were, where we are now, and where we're headed. So a lot of exciting things in our world. Yeah. And I would say if you don't have somebody who's growth minded, then maybe they're not a fit, you know? So keeping that in mind, if they're like, oh, I just want to do this forever. It's like, okay. If that aligns with what you're looking for, perfect. If you're a growth minded person, be looking for growth minded people. Just some things to avoid, right? Oops. Here's some risks. Here's some things that we might do wrong is you hired too fast, you took on your cousin, somebody seemed really great, so you didn't go through all the steps, and you hired the wrong person. Well, keep in mind, it's not only bad for you, but it's bad for the new hire. So really make sure you invest the time in hiring the right person. Make sure your budget can withstand the investment you're going to make. Um, 
Because here's the risks, is it could be dragging you down. It could be sucking your time. It could be sucking your energy if you hire the wrong person. You're going to have to do preparation and training. You have a financial commitment to these people as well as yourself. And kind of the worst thing that can happen is you hire the wrong person, slows you down. You miss out on opportunities over here, right? Because you're like, well, I'm going to slow down to speed up. So I'm going to, I can't follow up on everything because I got to train this person over here. So your business shrinks a little bit and then you hire the wrong person. So not only did you make less money on the top, you actually lost money on the bottom because you were paying a candidate that wasn't a fit for you and your team. So there are some risks involved when you don't go through the process and hire the right person for you and invest the invest the time because it will pay off in the long run if you really invest in hiring the right person for your team. So I am going to thank everybody for coming. I'm going to stick around for as long as questions. You can throw some stuff in the chat. You can come off mute. You can ask some questions. Um, again, I hope you, or I trust you guys have found some information in this presentation useful and I will just say too, if all of this sounds absolutely terrible and you just want to be an expert on sales, you can always reach out if you want to talk about partnering with our team. Um, so I'll just give everybody a minute and see if there's any questions in chat. Um, thank you. So question? Yeah. First off, thank you very, very much. Um, I appreciate you encouraging me to be present um, because it was a wealth of information. Whereas I, I saw one bullet that attracted to me. So um, with that said, you made reference to um, a group meeting. Mm -hmm. Am I present at the group meeting? Sarah, I'll let you handle that. So if you are the one doing the hiring, you are not present at the group meeting. So for our world, I manage the hiring. I'm not present at the group interview. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Sarah, also. You are a wealth of information. And um, the two of you, uh, three of you, let's say, um, are very generous. So I, I, I appreciate, um, you know, the opportunity to sit with you guys. Thanks, Mary. We appreciate you, too. Thanks for the kind words. I'll just um, check if there's any other questions in the chat and thank you for all the kind words in the chat. And I, and I really do hope that you guys found some of this um, helpful as far as growing your business, really slowing down to make sure you hire the right person and the investment in time up front will definitely pay off in the long run. So um, really appreciate everybody being here. So Thank you for your time today. Always reach out if you have any questions, even after the fact. We're happy to, to be here and be a resource and um, hope everybody has a great day. Thanks, everybody.